Hey, everybody. Are you with me when I say life can be amazing at times, but it can also be extremely challenging? I know. I've been there myself. Learned some valuable life lessons along the way, and now I'm here to help you. It's no coincidence you've found your way to the Relevate podcast. I'm your host, Rena Olson, a self-proclaimed inspirer of others. Together, we're going to dive deep into raw and honest conversations with real people. My hope is that through these stories, you too will be inspired and ready to tackle whatever's holding you back or breaking your heart. Then you'll be free to live a life of purpose and true fulfillment. I promise it's possible. Let's Relevate. Hey friends, welcome to this episode of the Relevate Podcast. I'm your host, Rena Olson, with the first ever live recording of the podcast captured at a recent event sponsored by my friends at The Connection. You may have heard that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but connection, hence the name of the organization. The Connection is a recovery community organization, or RCO, in Forsyth County, Georgia, a suburb of Atlanta. Simply put, recovery community organizations are independent, nonprofit organizations led by members of the local recovery community. You'll find them popping up all over the country to support people in recovery. At an RCO, people can attend a variety of support meetings, receive free peer coaching, and share in sober social events in connection with other people. The topic discussed at this meeting, how to de-stress the holidays. I'd say that's a topic applicable for everyone, whether in recovery or not, wouldn't you say? This conversation is led by an expert on recovery in this area, Joe Abney, a licensed professional counselor. I know you'll enjoy this conversation as much as I did. Please share with your friends so we all can have a little more joy and a little less stress this holiday season. So, for those of you who don't know me, uh, you can't really see it because you're all over there, but I put it on the board. My name is Joe Abney. I am an LPC, which is a licensed professional counselor. So, I'm a master's level psychotherapist. I do family work, couples work, all kind of stuff that doesn't have anything to do with recovery. But I'm also a CAADC, which is a certified advanced alcohol and drug counselor. You have to have a master's degree to get that particular credential, too. I'm not showing off. I just want you to know there's a reason that they asked me to do this. I have the experience in doing this. And I also like to say that doesn't mean I'm an expert because you guys have your own experiences in life, and we all have things to teach each other, you know. And so I find any time I do a group that sometimes the most profound things that are said come from the people who are in the group okay so I'm I'm by no means am I setting myself up as some like you know listen to me and shut up person (laughs) I really want this to be a conversation okay Um, so that's who I am I am one of the founding members of the RCFF that that made this place possible I'm very proud of that I'm no longer sitting on that board but uh, we had our very first meeting ever at my office, and, uh, and I'm just really tickled to be part of that because it's so cool to see this place and to see people using it. So what I need from you guys is I want to get an idea of where we want to go tonight and what you want to talk about. Um, it's my understanding that we're going to have kind of a mix of people who are either family members or people in recovery or just people who are just here for the hell of it. At this point, Joe went around the room and asked, what specifically stresses you out about the holidays? The responses from those who were there were raw, honest, and heartfelt. She captured answers on the whiteboard and guided the conversation from there. Let's pick it up. Those of you who are earlier in recovery, or, or, you know, just even if you're not early in recovery, where the holidays may trigger things, it's really important to start with the most basic stuff. What are my triggers? And what are the triggers I haven't thought about since last year when the holidays were here? And how do I plan ahead of time to avoid those triggers or to navigate around them when I can't avoid them? Okay? So again, we've already heard some good things. Planning where you're going to park. Having your back pocket excuse 
ready. I mean, I make, you know, I'm serious, make it up. It doesn't have to be elaborate. As a matter of fact, I would say that your back pocket excuse should be very, very vague. Um, I learned when I dealt with a difficult person in my life a long, long time ago that I, I was, you know, people pleaser. I would say yes too often. So I learned very quickly to say, I'm sorry, I have plans. Because there's no sense in me saying, you're asking too much of me and I resent it. Right? I just learned to say, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. I have plans. What are your plans? Well, I have plans. You know, I'm sorry, but they, I can't change them. But I just, you know, I have some plans, somebody else. In my head, I'm thinking, yeah, my plan is to never accommodate your butt again because you ask too much of me and you trigger me and I resent it, you know. And so, you know, that's a conversation you can't really have with somebody, right? You can. I shouldn't say that as a counselor. You can, but it doesn't always do any good. You know, when you talk about people with mental illnesses, other mental illnesses, they're not going to hear it. It's just a waste of your time. You are in control of you. You don't have any control over anything outside of you, your actions and your thoughts. And that's what you need to rein in because that's where you're going to get relief from this stress, okay? So again, the stress is... Any change, the stress is, one of the things I hear kind of as a theme here are the expectations. You know, you, you turn on the TV, and it's not just we pick on Norman Rockwell, poor guy, fabulous painter, but, you know, the Life Channel, Lifetime Channel, the Hallmark Channel, you know, the, all of these things, right? They, Publix That's commercial. <laughs> yeah, the Publix commercials. Yeah. The Publix commercials are crazy, right? Yeah, the cage it's a fantasy. Cage it's a fantasy. That's a fantasy. Nobody really lives that life. A lot of people try damn hard to make their life look like it, but the reality is nobody, nobody lives that life, right? So stop trying to live that life. Stop trying to live that life. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, not that I'm not that I'm saying anyone should lie. I'm just saying that a stomach virus or an upset stomach usually gets you out of anything because no one wants to ask any questions. I love that. Yeah. I love you know, that. When you're with somebody, you know, talk about this in advance. If you've got somebody going, if you have to attend some holiday party. Yeah, the, instead of just having the safe word banana, you know, that everybody goes like, what? Too obvious. He said, my safe word is, oh, oh. Yeah, well, in the past, I have used that when I don't want a drink. When mm -hmm. I'm somewhere and I'm okay, but quit pushing me, it's, it's you know, I really don't feel so good. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, oh. Oh, yeah. Okay, then have a Coke. That's yeah. Yeah, you know, ginger ale is what you need. Yeah. What are some other things that people have used to sort of excuse themselves politely? As soon as the biggest guy in the room starts screaming out the I love you's, it's time to go. Yes. And then as soon as you, and, and the first conversation I hear between two people who are talking over each other, and they just keep getting louder and louder and louder, and nobody's listening, and then I know that, it, it, yeah, the, they, they, this whole thing is jump a shark, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's a good a good um, boundary to set around those triggers. Because we do not like to be around. I mean, you know, it's not going to be good for any of us in this room to be. It's not good for anybody to be around when it starts getting that crazy. Right? It's just no fun. No fun at all. So um, I want to talk a little bit about the, the first sober holiday, just to kind of piggyback on the planning. Is this anybody else that's their first sober holiday? You've got two? Your second? Okay, so you, you got some people who are just like right ahead of you there. Right ahead of you there. I had something that I ran across on the internet. Um, I, was doing, I was doing some research, and uh, uh, you know, people want to have, you're drinking and all that, you want to have fun. You still want to have fun. You don't want to just be in a closet all the time and all that. So, anyhow, um, I did some research, and they have something, uh, a couple of places around the country have something called a sober bar. Mm -hmm. Where they don't serve any those. alcohol. But I've it's seen down those in Florida dry bars. It's and New York. Cool. There's nothing close. I think maybe one in Texas. So somebody in the Atlanta area ought to come up with some mm -hmm. idea like that. Because people still want to get together and hang out and have fun. Yeah, and stuff, I think know? that's a great, that's that's a thing we hope that catches on. So I want to touch on this because with family, you've said that your family's difficult and that's your number one trigger. And so I know I've already kind of touched on that. You gotta plan for that. I'm just wondering if you have any kind of sense of what you need to do. 
that we could help you with? So, you know, I just went through Thanksgiving, and I, once I got there, I set the expectation, and my mom knows I'm going through all this. She thinks, she thinks my drinking is not a problem, and I'm blowing it up because... It takes attention away from her, you know, right. my focus on this. But anyway, so when I got there, I set the expectation that if I need to go have some downtime, if I need to go be alone, I'm going to go do it. I'm going to read or whatever if I have to get away from everybody for a little while. Mm -hmm. and, Is it a large family? Well, the group that we went to, yes, the, the gathering was large. But other than that, no, it's just me and my mother. Okay. So. Okay. I don't know. That's one thing. So the boundaries worked for you. You you said that day because <laughs> that's a kind of a little mini preview, yeah. right? Right. So, right. so is there anything that you feel now that you've been through your mini preview? Is there anything that you feel like you could have done better, or you need to plan for for anything upcoming, Christmas, New Year's, whatever? Well, just just the fact that at Christmas it's just going to be even longer. You know. A longer period of time. Okay, so it's not just one day. It's a... right, exactly. It'll be several days together. Okay, so those of you who've been through it, any words of wisdom that really helped you through your first holiday? Keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> say a little more about that. Just try not to say like too many long-winded answers. Mm -hmm. You know, keep things short and sweet. Mm -hmm. If somebody's asking too many questions. Go get something to eat. Mm -hmm. Instead of saying, hey, bug off, you just like, ah, I think I'm hungry. I don't need to know the whole story and all, yeah. you know, everything I've been up to. And, like, I don't need the download of, you know, mm -hmm. my life to what, you know, I just, oh, yeah, mm -hmm. it's nice and move mm -hmm. on. Whatever. Just keep it polite and back. Keep it polite. Feel like you can back out of the room at any point. Much, you, know. you know, I think it's what I'm hearing there. I, I was taught, especially like when I, when I first came out of treatment, was a lot of those tricks of make sure that you always have an escape. Mm -hmm. No matter what it is, always have always some have sort of an escape plan. Make sure you always have your car. Make sure that you have your headphones. Mm -hmm. So if you need to go sit in a corner and say, I got to go meditate for 10 minutes, put your headphones on mm -hmm. and nobody will talk to you. Go outside, take a walk, mm -hmm. um, do, you know, say, I got to take this call and go sit in your car and play on Facebook for the next 30 minutes until you get mm -hmm. a grip back on, all right, I can That's walk back one. in there with a safe face. I would just say, yeah, I got to go, I got to go make a call real quick. I got a business call. I know it's a pain in the ass. It's the holidays. I can't believe they're talking to me. And just sit in your car and talk to yourself for 45 minutes mm -hmm. until I sit there and have a conversation with God for like 45 minutes going, okay, look, I I need you to really help me out here because if I go back in there, I might stab someone in the eye with a fork. So let's work let's on this. Let's not do that. Yeah. You know, <laughs> let's not do that. So let's just, can you help me out, please? And I would go out and have conversations with myself and lock myself in the bathroom upstairs. But that was how I got through the first mm -hmm. three Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, that Holidays. is the beautiful thing about cell phones these days is we could just pretend they're ringing. Right? We could just exactly. say, oh, 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 i got to take this um, and just, yeah. You know, especially if it's, it's your mom and the more times that you need to take that, the more times you need to take that 15, 20, 45 minute break, she'll get used to that and it will become normal for mm -hmm. you to do that because I know you're going to be spending those, that length of time with your mom. You know, and so she will get used to you taking those breaks and just take them. I wouldn't ask permission. Ask no, for don't ask permission. Always yeah. ask don't for ask permission. permission. Never this permission. The, um, smart recovery meeting last week, somebody talked about having someone that you can call. And um, mm -hmm. I did um, at, tell my best friend she knows what I'm going through with the not drinking and she her mother also makes her crazy and I said can I call you if I just have had enough during the holidays just for a few minutes to vent and she said yes so I thought that was a good idea yeah. that's a very good idea that's right you get some more phone numbers here that's Absolutely. a beautiful thing and if you, and this one reason why I was kind of asking if it was local or something because also planning some ways to get out and away from it you know planning to meet somebody out at the movie planning to do some things that get you completely out of it so that you could just make it you know just take it in doses and not have to be there the whole time because even if things are going well it'll do your head a lot of good to just get in a new environment for a minute you know so go have lunch with a friend if you can go check it out a movie go take a walk in the park whatever it is that suits your lifestyle you know take your dog with you so you have an excuse to take long walks 
So as a mother in the room who has old kids who, who don't have any addiction issues that I know of anyway, Mm -hmm. I'm sure I make them nuts. Mm -hmm. So this is not an addiction thing. Mm -hmm. This is sort of a family, is family thing. This is family. And, yeah. and, and speaking because there are others of us here who also have older kids, um, maybe realizing that, you know, you're going to make them nuts anyway and just let them go do whatever stuff mm -hmm. they did. If I am true to myself, mm -hmm. my boundaries, so I'm calm. Mm -hmm that I have the right, and that's really probably the best way, even if they say, well, no, 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 you're not doing what you've always done for me. How, how, how does that work both ways? Be, yeah. Well, it's a dance, you know? That is a dance. And you each kind of suck each other into whatever it is your dance is with your family members. So part of that, to me, goes into the idea of expectations. Like a lot of our heartache and stress around any kind of holiday is what is our expectation out of this, you know, do I want the snow to fall, you know, and it's probably going to be 70 degrees with 80% humidity or something. Because you're in Atlanta. So <laughs> but, but, but that expectation, and so it does work both ways. We have an expectation of what mom's going to provide. We have an expectation of what's going to happen when certain people come, when certain things, you know, we have an expectation about, you know, the gifts that we give and that we get and all of these expectations, and I would just invite you all to kind of look at what those expectations are and try to let them go. You know, try not to get too wrapped up in those because the reality is each, each situation is going to be what it's going to be, and you never know what's going to happen. Um, and so, you know, that the recovery dharma, I'm sure, talks about that. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Detachment. So I think that learning how to, to really just sit and say, oh, that was my expectation. Some of my expectations come from reality of what's happened in the past. Some of my expectations come from stupid public commercials. Some of my expectations just come from what I really want it to be. I want my life to look like this. But, you know, it doesn't. You know, the other part of the problem with expectations is that they're mine and nobody else knows what they are. So the likelihood of those expectations being met mm -hmm. is pretty damn terrible. Oh, uh, I mean, yeah. If I'm going to set expectations and keep them a secret, I should expect to get my butt kicked. Well, and there goes, there, that's a beautiful segue, because that kind of goes back to, you know, when you were saying, oh, they don't invite me in to do things, right? I'm pulling you back into the conversation. Um, because, because the reality is, if you want to be part of it, you do need to say, hey, I want to be part of it. And if you want to string popcorn and cranberries, you need to say, come show up with the popcorn and cranberries. Say, I really want to do this. Who's going to join me? You know, if you want those things, you have to be the instrument of creation. But I think that speaks to vulnerability. But and not a lot of experience do I have with wanting to do that soberly. You know, when I was using, I could be as vulnerable as I wanted to be. I didn't care. Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, tiptoeing or trying to figure out where the boundaries are or what is appropriate mm -hmm. and sometimes I am not still appropriate right yeah and that's according to other people's definition of what's appropriate even for me like I'm like I can't believe I just said that okay you know? so you're still kind of feeling your way through it my brain is still healing mm -hmm. you know ultimately yeah, I, I, I'm rewiring so the old stuff is still in there, and it might come out wrong, or I trip over my tongue, or I just say <coughs> stupid shit, and then I'm like, oh, God. So here's another thing I'm just going to say to you, is that you are who you are, and you are where you are, and I just want you to be here now, and don't worry too much about those things. If you say something stupid, say, ah, I said something stupid, sorry about that, and keep moving. Mm -hmm. There's no reason to expect that you're going to be anything other than who you are, right? And you're always going to yeah. believe those things. But that's yeah. Hard. <laughs> hey, she is. That's her, though. That's hard. That's mine. Well, Years from now, you're going to have that. No. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are in recovery, post a right. Post acute withdrawal lasts sometimes up to three years. Oh, so yeah. your brain is still recalibrating on a lot of levels. Even if you've well, been. 
Well, some of those bad habits that we lay down never quite go away, um, but, but. Spent all those years learning them and now it's like, I mean, yeah, right. It's, you know, exactly, you know? Right. Oh, and I you was could, so good at all that stuff. Yeah, you know, that's the yeah. thing. Whoa. Yeah. 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 Expert at that. Well, yeah. And I. <laughs> I, I found that I had to, I had to very much like Mo was saying, that I had to honor my physical body, that my nervous system mm -hmm. was used to being tranked out like, you know, Seabiscuit in the mm -hmm. entire barn. Mm -hmm. and, and so to walk in there without any tranquilizer of any kind, without, you know, I put a thing on the peer advisory board this month that I'm, I'm getting ready for Thanksgiving. This is my fifth, set, you know, sober one. And here it is, I'm getting ready, and in my head I hear, oh, isn't it time for a Xanax now? And I'm like, I haven't had one of those in ages. But all I could think was I walked in, and I felt everybody's presence in the room, and it just it just took my nervous system on all levels that it was too much. And so I had to learn that there were a lot of physical things that were happening that... I had to give myself a break. I mean, yes. you can't sit there and, and comatose yourself and walk in one year and then next year go in completely wide open, like, you know, a, a wire that has no insulation on it totally and expect, yeah. to, expect to make it through that without, you know, eh, eh, you know. Right. That, and that goes back to that temper your expectation. You can't yeah. expect to handle it the way you did. On Xanax, right? Right. I did, when it, you're not on Xanax. I did it drunk for thirty years. I you're can't do now. it sober the first time or the second time or the third time, and think that I, I'm going to have it. I mean, mm -hmm. I started drinking when I was fourteen, so mm -hmm. showing up drunk and or high to every single Christmas was routine. Yes. So showing up as an adult. Not that way, with everybody staring at me going, is she going to go over there and steal the bottle of wine? Mm -hmm. You know, and everyone's staring at, you know, and you feel everybody's eyes on you. Is she is she still sober? Did she take a sip of something? Is she hiding over in the corner to go have something? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's 25 people in my family. That's 25 yeah. eyes on me, all expecting yeah. me to relapse every year. So yeah. there's a lot of just tension that comes with that. So I just looked at him and started going... Y'all look different when I'm not high. Mm -hmm. <laughs> y'all are y'all are much y'all were much easier to handle when I had a you know a, a liter of wine before I showed up yeah. and kind of laughed it off on some of it. You know, y'all threw it right back at them. I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> um, so well, yeah, because you because you know you touched on not just the, the expectation, but there was something that we put, oh the trust, the lack of trust, mm -hmm. and I you know because that came up that people are just thinking. Oh, what are they thinking? Are they expecting me to screw up? Or they're still angry at the last screw up I made or whatever. And, and I wanted to address that a little bit since you brought it up so well, that, that whether or not your family trusts you is out of your control. The only way you're going to get it back, the only thing you can do to have any influence on whether that happens and when it happens is to go about doing what you're doing well, you know what I'm saying? Stay in recovery, take care of yourself, set good boundaries, be polite, but don't be a doormat, and just wait it out, because that takes time, and different people are going to come to it differently, and some people may never come to it. And that is their problem, that is their issue, not yours, okay? And, and I, just want you to, I just want you to kind of own that, because while you may have done something just horrible in your usage that created that lack of trust. I'm not saying that you're not culpable, right? I'm not saying you get a freebie on that. I'm just saying you're choosing not to do that. You're choosing recovery. Walk in with the confidence of a person that knows I'm choosing recovery now and I'm doing the best I can do to be that person that I want to be. And whether or not Aunt Mary decides I'm okay now is really on Aunt Mary. Do you understand what I'm saying? That makes sense? Because, you know, Aunt Mary has her whole history of issues coming into it, too. And that's going to inform when and how and whether she ever trusts you again. Does that feel true? I wanted to address that because, you know, well, because it came up. And, and I think that's a big one. We do, you know, it's like, it's so hard early in recovery because it's hard to stay clean, right? It's hard. It, it takes work. And we want people who've never been there, who've never been addicted, to pat us on the back and say, damn, good job. But they don't understand because 
what they're seeing is, well, you're finally acting like everybody else. You know, you're finally doing what everybody else does. You know? So you can't expect, going back to expectations, you can't expect those people in your family to pat you on the back and say, good job. All right? If they do, you are very lucky. Drink it in and say, yes, thank you. <laughs> you know? Because they really, they don't know. They don't know. They've yeah, never been if there. If you come from a dysfunctional family, like uh, my mom has five kids and we all five qualified, well, all five qualify for the club. Mm-hmm. You suddenly realize after, or you come to realize after a couple of years that you're more healthy than all of those people emotionally, and that, you know, they're kind of looking at you like, oh, isn't he holier than thou? Yeah, mm-hmm. hot shit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and you kind of yeah. sit there and go, well, no, I'm not, but okay. You know, if that's if if if, if mm-hmm. I make you uncomfortable because I'm not acting a fool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's a mirror in the bathroom. If you dare go take a that, look. That's, and that's classic <laughs> codependency stuff, right? Because mm-hmm. people have been adjusted to your bad behavior, and in some ways they have propped themselves up. You know, being being the person that's there to save you from yourself and those kind of things. And so you've taken that, that role away from them. And you will get some pushback, especially early in recovery. You get it a lot. And Over time, all, hopefully, it will subside. There are those people that you just have to choose not to deal with, not to see. Yes. I have family members that I will not see, either for short periods of time, definitely not during the holidays. It just never, it just can't happen because they're still in yeah. their addiction and I'm not going to be a part of it. Yeah, good boundaries. Ba- yeah, Beautiful it's boundaries. Hard. It's, it hurts. It is, it's your yeah. Members, for God's sake. So one of the things, when it's somebody that you feel like you have to do it, and when I say have to, I mean like you really want to, you know, it's again, it's that planning thing. Like maybe that's somebody you need to meet at Waffle House for a cup of coffee, you know, <laughs> something, you know, um, something like that early in the day before they've gone too far, before they've gotten into their thing yet. After you know, there are ways around that. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, we're having Christmas dinner at 7 a.m. After the hangover and before the next drink. That's right. So, um, so there's that. I want to talk a little bit about the death thing and the loss thing because that's, that's, um, you know, gosh, loss is permanent, and we can't change it, and there's nothing we can do to influence it, and it's hard. And it brings up that full-body experience of grief is there, and there's nothing you can do to stop that from coming. And so I think for, for those of you who have suffered loss, either, either through death or from separation for the people you really want to be with, I want you to be gentle with yourself is really what I want to say. And I want you just to acknowledge that that's what you're feeling because you'll feel it. We were not, it's, it's almost traumatic. Our, our, our bodies are meant to feel that, and that's why we feel it, right? Grief is something that always stays with you. When you lose people that you loved who were always there, that you'll never get them back. So it, it's not like a lot of people say, oh, the first year is the hardest. I don't find that to be true. I find it to always be hard. So I just say this. If your voice cracks because you're talking about somebody or it's bringing up a memory for you, let it crack. If your eyes tear up, let them tear up. Acknowledge it. Be with it for a minute. Allow that to move through you because your body needs that to move through to you. If you suck that back in, it's going to come out worse later. Acknowledge it for what it is and just be real with it. You know, it's very much like your recovery. Just say, just be able to say, this is hard. It's kind of hard for me to not, to not have that person in my life with me today. Uh, and allow yourself to, to be there. Another thing that you can do, especially um, where death is concerned, if you can do something in honor of the person that's passed on, you know, one of the things about this time of year is that there are opportunities, you know, go find an angel tree. I saw one today. Where was it? I think it was at Panera Bread. Go find an angel tree and buy some kid a bicycle. Go do something. It goes back to what Joe was saying about the sense of giving back. It doesn't take that much to take something off an angel tree and go buy some kids some socks and a new outfit. You know, go do it. It'll make you feel better. You can do it in honor of the person that you lost. You know, you can have a conversation in your head with that person while you're doing it. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not odd. Do it. I think it would actually be a really cool thing for the Smart Recovery Group to do, just go and, you know, everybody pull 
you know, everybody throw 10 bucks in the hat and go find a couple of things, you know. Yeah, I've got a um, giving back project I'm going to be doing soon for this, you know, thing that we're in. So I'm just trying to look for something that, uh, you know, has an impact. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Maybe that can... I mean, the point of angel trees is to make sure that children get to have some kind of Christmas. Right. You know, and so that's a beautiful thing, and you can feel good about it. You'll never see it. You'll never get thanked for it, but you can feel good about it. And so I think that's a really nice way to give back. So often the elderly who are not at home anymore are so lonely in just doing a visit, mm -hmm. being there and walking through, and only a human hi, mm -hmm. hand on the shoulder or something does so much good for them. Oh, uh, yes. So also, there are a lot of elderly who could just use someone who would walk in, hi, how, how are you, and only for a moment. That is so true. Right, that is you so can true. You for sure. Go take a little craft for them to do or something. You know, if you want a good cry for those, because I'll bet you probably do, but I bet nobody else here knows. Go home and do a, you know, Google a YouTube video of John Prine singing Hello in there, and it'll make you cry. Hello, Won't it? Oh, my God. It'll just break your heart. Hello, yeah. yeah. Hello in there. It's like, that's all old people want is for you to talk to them. Yeah. You know? So um, I, I do want you to just really embrace that idea that loss is in grief. It's not just a mental thing. It's a physical thing. And, and allow yourself to feel it and find a safe place to feel it. Call somebody, go take a walk, go whatever it is you need to do, but allow yourself to feel it. It's important that you acknowledge it. Don't stuff it, okay? <laughs> Dealing with an active user, we've kind of touched that, and I like that, knowing who you can't, <laughs> who you just can't handle, you know, and, and handling them differently when you have to, and excusing yourself when you have to. Too much idle time. We didn't really hit on that. Yeah. He's got time. <laughs> so, so, yeah, get up and do something. Read a book. Watch it. Get up and do something. Start something new. I know. I said read a book because I knew you, was, you would laugh because nobody reads books anymore. But find some activities. Find something. Find something to occupy. Find somebody to help. Find somebody to help. Yeah, absolutely. Go on. I, I, I love the idea of going to work in a pantry, food pantry. I would too try not to overcommit. Like, you know, that's a big thing too with calendars. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm really like kind of selfish. Like, I don't want to do everything that I'm invited to. I'm just going to stay in my pajamas and watch the parade a little bit. I mean, it's totally okay to say I'm no. Busy. You don't need to know where wow. I am all the time. No. I'm busy. I'm working. It's totally okay to say no. I, again, I have plans. You don't have to say any more than that. Right. I'm so sorry. I'd love to do that, but I have plans. I'm being honest. Yeah. I'm just not with this. And yeah. I'm going to That's exactly myself. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And accept him. So, you know, I'm going to say dumb shit. Mm -hmm. No, you heard it dumb. I, you didn't say it dumb. Oh. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that honesty. I think, uh, you know, when I came up with the I have plans, I was being honest. Because I, the part I didn't say is my plan is to never accommodate you again. Mm -hmm. That's my plan. I don't need to tell you that because I'll piss you off and then we'll just have an argument. And I don't want to have an argument. I just want to tell you I have plans. So, yeah, but I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Sometimes it's just to say, you know what, it's all too much for me. And I, tonight I'm hanging out in my pajamas with a good movie. Yeah. That's fine. That you have the right. Me, you know? I agree. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um I think right here in this room, you kind of figure out, if you, if you have a problem with isolation, I want you to remember the connection. It is open every day. Right. And your friends, all these people, whether you know them, you, may, you don't even know them yet, but they're your friends. Yeah. And, and this is a group of people, and this is true of any 12-step meeting, of any smart recovery meeting, of any recovery dharma meeting, of anything. You can walk into those, and, and if you're going out of town, Look online before you go where they are, and I would look for all of them. Even if you don't do 12-step, you'd like SMART better, find out where they are. Because if you're going to be out of town, that's a really nice thing that you can just go and be around some people who get where you are. You know, that you could just walk in and say, I don't know, it's a really shitty day, and they'll get it. The anti-commercialism, we've kind of hit on that one, and I really, again, set your boundaries and, and do it the way you want to do it. You know, you don't have to give 
pretty things from the store. You can get pretty things you did. You can give your time. Um, the sense of dread and the fear of aloneness and the disappointment all go back to that expectation, that sense of we're supposed to be this way. I'm supposed to have fun. I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm supposed to be happy. And, and all of those are just uh, cognitive distortions. Those are not real. Those are not real. Those are things that we've been bought, we have bought. Even if you're not a good, even if you're not much of a reader, one thing that you might want to try to read, and during the holidays would be a good time to do it, is the Four Agreements, where it talks about how we buy all of these ideas that people are giving us, and, uh, and we don't have to buy them. We don't have to buy them. They just cause distress. And it's a very easy read. It's kind of a fun read. The thing, you know, it, it, it reminds me of what my mother always said is there's, there's always people that have it worse than you. There's always people that have it worse than you. There's always people that have it better than you, you know. So uh, it can help you really be thankful for how easy your life is to read a story like that. Yeah. All right. Anything anybody else want to share before we say goodnight? Thank you. Was this helpful? Yes. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday. You're sweet. You're welcome. Have a great holiday, guys. For me personally, I find the holidays to be a bittersweet mix of sweet and salty. My heart gets panged extra hard this time of year, especially for my sweet mom, who now has a heavenly home. My mom loved Christmas with every fiber of her being and decorated our home lavishly with tacky plastic poinsettias. I mean, they were everywhere. For me, rather than trying to shut the emotion down of the memories, I lean in and remember and let the tears flow as they often do and look up in thanks for the gift of her life and her love. No doubt the holidays can be hard, y'all. Remember that and send out a little extra love to those who may be struggling, even if that person is you. The time may also be right for you to connect in some type of community, like the connection if you're in recovery or a good local church. A good church will truly help you find your way back home. Thank you to the connection. Joe Abney, and everyone who contributed to this fabulous discussion and allowing my Relevate listeners a chance to listen in. To learn more about The Connection, visit theconnectionforsight.org. Stay strong and loving during the holidays, friends. You so can do it. I'm Rena Olson, and this is Relevate. <laughs>